there is no comprehensive law to take action uh, and to punish the uh, whoever uh, have been responsible uh, responsible for this particular act of Bhopal gas tragedy. So it has been realized that there is no proper legal mechanism uh, under which the corrective measures can be taken. Good morning students, welcome back to Plutus IS. So today we are in, uh, today is our 23rd day, okay. Till now we have covered 22 topics, today we are going to see the 23rd topic. So today topic is, uh, today's topic is environment related acts. So as you all know, there are many questions previously asked from this area also, uh, environment related acts. So right, we will, today we will see the, uh, some of the important acts. Uh, uh, when it comes to environment. So uh, I try to take some of the important acts. You also from your side try to uh, know more about some other acts also, right? So in the series of acts, the first act is the Water uh, Water Act. It is enacted in 1974. Uh, full name of the act is the Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1974, right? So the, uh, the major object of this act is it has been enacted to mitigate the adverse effects of pollution on water bodies. So we can say this is the prime motive of the act. So the act has been enacted to prevent the adverse or to mitigate the adverse effects of the pollution on water bodies. Hence the name Water Act. So it is a comprehensive law when it comes to uh, preventing the water pollution and uh, safeguarding the all aspects related to water in India, right? We will see the key provisions of the act. So the act firstly provides a regulating authority. So basically uh, at the central and at the state level, a proper regulating authorities have been provided through this act that is Central Pollution Control Board and state pollution control boards at state levels. So these two regulatory, these, I mean, two kinds of regulatory bodies have been designated through the act. One uh, body is at the center, central pollution control board. And uh, at the each state level also, state pollution control board has been created. So basically the, these will oversee the, uh, oversee and enforce the pollution related control measures, right? Standard setting. So basically various standards have been prescribed. Standards for what? For uh, effluent discharge. So uh, this is to uh, make sure that industries are not releasing polluted waters directly into the environment. So as we all know in India, the major problem uh, when it comes to rivers or uh, even the groundwater is the effluents, uh, they are directly uh, being released into environment, especially into water bodies, to, uh, to rivers and also uh, to the groundwater without uh, purifying, with, uh, without. So the major problem in India is industries are directly releasing, releasing the polluting and hazardous wa waters directly into the environment, especially into the water bodies without treating them. So earlier, this treatment of wastewater has been absent so because of the, these reasons. Many of the water bodies have been, uh, in India have been uh, destroyed because of this reason. So basically, this act, Water Act, uh, I mean, it prescribes certain standards to what kind of waters can be released into the environment. So it also oversees whether industries are adhering to those standards or norms or not. So if they are not adhering the fines, respective fines, and there will be penalties. So that will also will be overseen by uh, CPSB and SP, uh, CP, CPCB and SPCBs. Next important uh, provision is pollution control committees. So basically there is a provision for establishment of pollution control committees. So basically these will assist the assist in monitoring and uh, monitoring water quality and uh, implementing pollution control measures. So basically there is a provision for pollution uh, control committees also. 
Next one is monitoring mechanisms. The act outlines the mechanisms for uh, monitoring the water quality so that the polluted water is not being released into the environment. Next one is penalties and uh, enforcement. So basically there are within the act, there are penalizing provisions. I mean, whoever violates these standards or uh, provisions, there are penalties prescribed within the act. Penalties are prescribed for whoever violates the uh, norms related to water pollution. Right. If we see the objectives of the act, so first of all, it has uh, objectives for uh, preventing, I mean, uh, preventing measures for who uh, those uh, who are releasing polluted waters into the environment. So to prevent pollution of water bodies and ensure sustainable management of water bodies, uh, the act provides certain mechanisms. Next one is regulatory framework. We have understood this. So basically this act also provides regulatory for, uh, framework in the form of CPCBs and uh, CPCB and SPCBs. Next is public health protection. So one of the major ob objectives of this particular act is also to protect public health. So this is a broader aspect, public health protection. So when water pollution is prevented, when uh, water standards are properly maintained, so directly and indirectly also the health of the public is being protected. So it is also one of the major objectives of the act. Next is obviously environment conservation. So when water pollution is prevented, it will directly tra transform into protection of protection and conservation of environment. Right. So these are some of the key provisions and uh, major ob objectives of the Water Act. So try to remember these key provisions and the important objectives. Next one is another important act, the AIR Act of 1981. So act has been enacted in 1981. The complete name of the act is the AIR Prevention and Control of Pollution Act of 1981. So basically the act has been enacted to combat adverse impacts of air pollution. So previous act, water act has been enacted to fight the water pollution. The air act has been enacted to fight the air pollution. And uh, the subsequent impact of this air pollution on the uh, health and well-being of the uh, humans and also the other uh, aspects of the environment. So basically, the Air Act has been enacted to fight air pollution. Fight air pollution and its ill effects. Right. When we see the key objectives of this uh, particular act, so it also provides a regulatory authority, same authority, CPCB, Central Pollution Control Boards, right cpcb central pollution control boards and the state pollution control boards will be there and the power has been vested the regulatory power has been vested uh, in these bodies to regulate and to control the uh, air pollution similarly uh, similar to the water act this act also prescribes uh, emission standards so <coughs> so it sets the em uh, emission emission standards so up to which levels the uh, we can say polluted air or for that matter the various uh, gases or air air or gases that are being released from the factories and industries they can be released to the environment released into the environment so basically when uh, standards are not being met so there will be, uh, I mean, there will be certain mechanisms to treat the treat the polluted air uh, to, uh, I mean, to absorb the hazardous gases and also the dust particles. Dust particles. So all these, uh, if standards are not being met, so the whatever the gases that are coming or the polluted air that is coming from the industries that is being released from the industries so it has to be treated and only then it can be 
release into the environment so those kind of standards also have been set by this particular act next is monitoring and assessment so basically the act has prescribed the monitoring and assisting assessment mechanisms whether the gases that are being released from the industries they are following or whatever the gases released they are up to the standard or not so this mechanism is also provided through the act next it also gives some pollution uh, control measures so it outlines various measures to control air pollution including installation of pollution control equipment so there are various types of uh, equipments to absorb various, various gases like carbon monoxide sulfur dioxide nitrous oxide so various equipment is there to absorb these kind of pollution pollutants and uh, these all types of control measures have been prescribed by the act so it also prescribes adoption of cleaner technologies and the promotion of renewable energy sources so this kind of mandate mandate is provided within the act so right enforcement and penalties so the act also have the enforcement mechanism so whoever violates this particular whatever the standards set by the act there is a provision for penalty also right so whoever violates the pollution related uh, uh, standards or uh, regulations there is a uh, provision for penalty also so if we see the major objectives of this act so public health protection so directly and indirectly when air pollution is prevented uh, there is i mean uh, good health for the human beings is assured next one is environmental conservation so through prevention of the air pollution uh, i mean we can realize that we can see that the environment is not harmed and the environment is protected next one is climate change mitigation so basically whatever the pollutants come from the industries they are majority of them are not only hazardous for human health but also greenhouse gases ghgs they are ghgs means they increase the temperature they increase the temperature of the environment so what results because of the rise in temperatures climate change so this act air act it also ensures that climate change i mean the effects of climate change are mitigated mitigated means the effects whatever the effects that are arising due to climate change their effects are not that much serious all right so this is also one of the important objects of this air act next is community engagement so in mitigating the effects of the climate change and also in reducing the air pollution the act prescribes that community has to be engaged properly so with community engagement only we can achieve the uh, we can say we can achieve the achieve the real impact in our uh, we can achieve real success in controlling the air pollution and subsequent uh, increasing uh, global increasing global temperatures and the subsequent climate uh, change so community engagement is also one of the important aspects of this particular act next one is uh, the most important and uh, very important act that is environment protection act of 1986 right so we have seen that already there is a water act there is an air act so why this environment protection act has come because in 1984 1984 uh, we have seen the bhopal gas strategy 1984 we have seen the bhopal gas strategy so it is bhopal gas tra tragedy has been considered as the worst industrial accident not only in india but also in the entire world so it is the worst industrial accident real accident thousands have been uh, dead through this accident but also many of the people who have uh, i mean because of the polluted environment there Uh, when this uh, accident happened 
so the surroundings have been polluted and the effects of that accident have even seen even now also even now also we can see the ill effects of this bopa gas tragedy so when this particular uh, incident has happened it has been realized that there is no comprehensive law there is no comprehensive law to take action uh, and to punish the uh, whoever uh, have been responsible uh, responsible for this particular act bopal gas tragedy so it has been realized that there is no proper legal mechanism uh, under which the corrective measures can be taken and also to punish the uh, whoever responsible for this incident to punish them also it has been realized that there is no proper legal mechanism so to address this uh, that uh, you can say gap loophole this comprehensive law has been brought in so it is a comprehensive legal uh, framework when it comes to the entire environment protection of entire environment we can say it is the first comprehensive law when it comes to the protection of the environment and to prevent uh, environmental pollution so when we understand the key uh, key provisions of this particular act so regulatory authority so it empowers the central government to take protective or proactive measures to protect and improve uh, environment equality to protect and improve the environmental quality right so it entrusts the central government to take measures to improve the uh, environment quality next is environmental standards so it authorizes the formulation of environmental standards and regulations for various activities industries and processes to prevent pollution and mitigate environmental damage next is notification of protected areas so through this act the government the central government can declare ecologically sensitive areas biodiversity hotspots and the critical habitats as protected areas to conserve their natural resources and biodiversity so whenever these areas have been demarcated or declared so there cannot be uh, establishment of polluting industries so in these areas where they have been declared as critical habitats so environmentally critical areas or they have lot of biodiversity so where there is lot of biodiversity we call those areas as uh, biodiversity hotspots so in all these areas no polluter polluting industries can be established or there is a classification of industries like green industries orange colored industries so there is a color coding uh, based on the polluting effect of that particular type of industry so in uh, demarcated areas only allowed industries can be established so this kind of mechanism is being provided through this particular act next is um, environmental impact assessment so this is the very very important aspect when it comes to the environment protection act of 1986 so through this environmental impact assessment it uh, mandates the for conducting mandates for conducting environmental impact assessments for projects and activities and policies likely to have significant environmental consequences so before start before starting the uh, activity or we can say before starting a project we have to study the impact forthcoming impact because of the uh, commencement of that project and its uh, subsequent impact on environment right so this has been mandated through the environment protection act so in uh, environment impact assessment has to be taken before starting a particular project so through this uh, environmental impact assessment act we can reduce the the uh, adverse effect of that particular uh, project on the environment so in this way the environmental impact assessment plays a significant role when it comes to creating or starting projects in an uh, ecologically sensitive area we can say or in overall protecting the uh, protecting the environment so the em environment impact assessment makes or plays a very critical role so through this mechanism we can 
uh, prevent uh, the adverse impact on the environment to a great extent. The major objectives of the act are so environmental conservation. So through the provisions just we have discussed, so we can protect the protect and conserve the environment by minimizing or mitigating the adverse effects uh, because of the projects we are starting. Next is pollution prevention. So whatever through the whatever measures that are being prescribed under this act, we can prevent the pollution also. Next is public health protection. So when environment is protected, the health of the public will be uh, obviously prom uh, promoted. Next is sustainable development. So whatever development we are making, it should not only be not lo not only mentioned. I mean, it should not only measured in simple terms of growth and development, but whatever development we are achieving, it should be sustainable. So to uh, the the development process to be sustainable, so resources, whatever natural resources are there, they have to be protected and they have to be preserved. So through this act, the Environment Protection Act, we can conserve and promote or protect the uh, resources, whatever resources are there, we can uh, conserve and protect them and we can transfer them to the future generations. Right. So in this way, we can achieve the sustainable socio-economic development without damaging the environment. Right. Next important act is the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. So in previous classes, we have studied both the national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. Right. So at this time also, when we were studying these both two aspects, we have understood that both national parks and wildlife sanctuaries, they are declared or announced under the WPA Act, Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. So this particular act is the base for declaring both national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. So it is enacted to address the escalating threats to wildlife populations and to protect wildlife and their habitats. Right. So whatever wildlife is there to protect those wildlife. And also we have understood that the major threat that has been faced by the faced by the wildlife is the habitat destruction. Habitat destruction. We can say this is the foremost threat that is faced by wildlife even today. So under this act, so there are provisions for to protect wildlife populations and also their respective habitat. So it, this particular act provides a robust legal framework right if you see the key provisions so through this act we can declare protected areas such as national parks wildlife sanctuaries and the conservation reserve so through this we can de also declare conservation reserves also to safeguard the critical habitats next one is species species protection right so it categorizes various uh, wildlife species into different schedules like schedule 1 schedule 2 schedule 3 and schedule schedule 4 and schedule 5 so uh, if an animal is uh, placed in schedule 1 or schedule 2 so it is given the highest protection so there is a ban on all types of poaching and killing of those kinds of animals so when it comes to examples tiger lion even elephants I mean, whoever are facing lot of threat when it comes to their existence. So all these animals have been kept in their in the schedules of one and two. So when a particular wildlife or wildlife species is put in this part, this, these particular schedules, they have given highest level of protection and they are all, all sorts, uh, sorts of ban on poaching or killing of these particular uh, animals. Right. So basically wildlife has been divided into different schedules. So you look for more detail about the uh, schedules and uh, animals. So which particular species has been kept in which particular schedule. So earlier also when I was discussing a particular question, I also discussed about the vermin. 
varmins certain kinds of wildlife have been declared as varmins such as rhesus monkeys and uh, blue bull nilgai so try to find out which kind of species is placed in which kind of schedule right right it also provides this particular act also provides for regulatory measures so uh, uh, it has a provision for regulating activities such as hunting poaching trade and uh, transportation of wildlife and their derivatives and whatever horns or their skin i mean basically the wildlife is hunted for their skin their nails and uh, whatever the horns they have so trade and transportation of both animals and the derivatives uh, uh, which have been uh, sourced from the animals so there are regulations and the restrictions prescribed through this act next it also provides for conservation strategies so the act encourages the formulation and the implementation of conservation strategies such as habitat restoration uh, restoration captive breeding programs for critically endangered species and uh, those numbers those species numbers which are dwindling faster <coughs> so <coughs> under this regulation only we have variety of breeding centers for vultures vultures vulture breeding program is there for crocodiles crocodile breeding program is there all right so all these have been initiatives have been started according to this particular act all right next one is community part participation so you also know without participation of the local people the conservation of wildlife is not practical and also it is not possible so the act mandates that the local population or community people who are living through i mean uh, all through the centuries they have to be made part and parcel of whatever conservation measures we have we are taking right the act also prescribes that one if we understand the objectives of this act uh, the important aspect is conservation of biodiversity conservation so obviously we can realize that whatever through whatever uh, provisions we have studied the obvious objective is biodiversity protection and conservation right so to conserve protect india's diverse wildlife species including mammals birds reptiles and am amphibians and even plants so the major one of the major objectives of this act is to biodiversity uh, protect the biodiversity next one is endangered species protection so when we were uh, studying the endangered species we have studied the iucn list and uh, different categories of uh, wildlife uh, we have seen critically endangered endangered and uh, vulnerable so these kinds of various uh, categories we have seen and also we have seen the particular species which comes into which is placed in which category in the iucn red book or red list so so the act prescribes uh protection measures for these uh, vulnerable or endangered species so there are various measures created include including the strict uh, anti poaching measures anti hunting measures and also uh, declaring natural national parks wildlife sanctuaries and also reserved areas for wildlife protection so through all these measures see the endangered species are being protected and also we have mechanisms like project tiger and project elephant project tiger is there project elephant is also there elephant is also there so these kinds of measures are also been initiated under this wildlife protection act right next one is habitat preservation so one of the critical aspect uh when it comes to conservation of critical endangered species is uh the habitat habitat protection right we have understood that one of the major reasons for dwindling of wildlife is the destruction of habitat or uh, uh we can say segmentation of the habitat so this act prescribe prescribes for habitat preservation and conservation preservation and conservation right next objective is 
ecosystem services so the act recognizes the ecosystem services that are provided by the environment and acts uh, this act uh, one of the aims is to conserve the services conserve the services provided this uh, particular uh, ecology or environment and uh, recognize those services and try and uh, try and ensure that these services are protected and maintained right another is cultural and recreational value so it also under this act there are provisions for promoting the cultural and uh, recreational value of the environment right to realize whatever the i mean services provided by the eco environment and to promote and to preserve those services cultural and recreational value and to create more of this when it comes to environment so these are some of the major objectives of the wildlife protection right next one is another important act the forest conservation act of 1980 right so this act has been enacted to address the escalating threats to forests due to deforestation encroachment and unsustainable land use practices so try to use uh, remember these phrases or vocabulary so these words can be picked up and they may be given in the examination so this major objective of this act is to uh, protect the environment or protect especially protect the forest due to threats various threats like deforestation encroachment encroachment of forest and uh, cutting the forest and uh, using that particular uh, forest for agriculture or for uh, building some industries or building residential uh, residential colonies etc right and unsustainable land use practices so this is also very very important unsustainable land use practices so this means uh, the land is being degraded day by day because of unsustainable land use practices because of erosion soil erosion because of soil salification salinization of soil or soil being turned uh, being turned into deserts so when unsustainable of uh, unsustainable use of land is happening so basically the land keeps on uh, degrading so to prevent that aspect also the forest conservation act has been enacted in 1980 right when we understand the critical aspects or key key provisions of this act first important aspect is prior approval prior approval for forest land diversion right so one of the key aspects of this act is one of the important provisions in this act is uh, prior approval for forest land diversion so the power has been vested in the central government when uh, there is a need for diversion of forest land for non forest purposes so when a land has to be transferred for non forest uh, purpose such as uh, uh, for mining for industry uh, for establishment of industry and for infrastructure development so for these kinds of developmental activities when forest land has to be transferred so the responsibility has been uh, put in the central government so the central government has been made as the authority for granting this permission so permission required for uh, transferring the forest land for non forest purposes right it also set a criteria for transferring this forest land for non forest purposes so it sets the criteria for granting approval for uh, the forest land to non forest purposes so that criteria one of the important aspects in that criteria is uh, there should be non availability of non forest land for the developmental projects so in only those cases the forest land can be transferred so this is one of the important criteria next is compensatory afforestation so when a development uh, pro pro uh, project has taken place for example mining has been started or a particular industry has been established so <coughs> there should be a compensatory forest so forest has to be created 
forest has to be created in a different area for in lieu of the whatever the forest that has been destroyed when creating that particular mine or that particular industry so there is a provision for compensatory afforestation within the particular act right <clears throat> so uh, it is made to offset the loss of forest cover due to uh, land diversion land diversion ensuring the restoration of enhancement of forest ecosystem and biodiversity right enforcement measures so just like the other acts there are enforcing mechanisms so provision uh, provision for penalties there penalties is there including legal consequences so whenever the provisions mandated by the act have been violated next is public participation so public participation has been made a component uh in uh, promotion and protection of the forest so basically they have given a lot of role in decision making when uh, converting the forest land uh, for non forest purposes so especially here when it comes to transfer of lands the gram sabha or gram sabha it uh, this particular gram sabha uh, which is i mean located in that area particular uh, land area where the la particular land has been transferred so the gram sabhas whoever has the right so they have been given a decisive say when it comes to transferring the land all right when we understand the objectives of this act so forest conservation so we can uh, from the name only we can find out that so the major objective of this act is so uh, forest conservation so including along with forest protection of biodiversity protection of soil water and ecological functions that are provided through the particular forest area next is sustainable land use so we can use land but whatever in whatever ways we are using the land so they should be sustainable so because we are using land the quality of land should not degrade right so this is to minimize address uh, adverse impacts on the forest ecosystems and to prioritize ecological integrity and the conservation priorities so basically whatever developmental activities we are doing on the land they have to be sustainable and whatever the practices we are adopting they have to be sustainable practices next is compensatory measures so wherever and whenever forest is being destroyed or that has been converted for non forest purposes so there should be compensatory mechanism so the forest has to be created in the uh, another area for a as a compensatory mechanism next another important objective is biodiversity protection so whenever the forest is pr protected so whatever the wildlife wildlife that is dependent on that particular forest it also will be protected next is environmental governance so whatever the laws and the regulations are there uh, pertaining to environment so to ensure proper governance proper governance of these environment related laws so the act has certain provisions so these are the major objectives of this particular act another important act is biological diversity act of 2002 right it has been enacted to address the escalating threats to biodiversity from habitat loss over exploitation so whatever resources are there so we are over exploiting them so to prevent the over exploitation also and prevent pollution and uh, prevent the invasive species so in invasive species are not native species so whenever they enter the an ecosystem the whatever the species existing there before their survival will be threatened so all the area will be occupied by these invasive species so to prevent the uh, the uh, we can say entry of these invasive species also this particular act has been brought in the biodiversity act of 2002 right so uh, when we understand the key provisions of the act first one is regulatory regulatory authority right the act establishes the national biodiversity authority nba and 
uh, in the states state biodiversity boards have been created to implement whatever rules and the regulations have been set up set up by this particular act so try to remember nba national biodiversity authority and state biodiversity boards have been created next is access and benefit sharing so whatever the biodiversity that has been utilized right so whatever the biodiversity resources have been utilized so there should be a benefit sharing benefit sharing so basically the we can say adivasis or uh, local people who are residing uh, within the forest or uh, we can say a forest area so basically they play an important role in conserving and promoting the biodiversity of that area right so whenever a benefit has been realized through this biodiversity so the local people have to be shared whatever the benefits we have taken the best example is we have many kinds of uh, medicinal herbs medicinal herbs so tribals have been using these herbs uh, for many centuries and curing the diseases so uh, for uh, for example a company or a person uh, takes this formula takes this herbs and creates a medicine and he starts using that uh, medicine or he starts selling that medicine so whatever the benefits or profits are coming those benefits and profits have to be shared uh, with these locals so that is the major idea behind the uh, benefit sharing mechanism access and benefit sharing right so there is a provision for regulating access to biological resources for example the traditional medicines uh, resources and the associated traditional knowledge by requiring prior prior approval and establishing mechanisms for equitable benefit sharing so whatever the practices are there first there should be a proper permission from the uh, knowledge holders and whatever the benefits uh, that are uh, coming uh, through this uh, through that particular aspect they have to be shared with the local people right next is biodiversity heritage sites so whatever the important areas are there biodiversity important areas they can be declared as biodiversity heritage sites so that they can be better protected and preserved right to conserve unique species habitats and ecological functions so at the national and the uh, international at the global level biodiversity heritage sites can be declared next is bioinformatics centers so whatever knowledge is there about the biodiversity and its uses so an in informatics centers have to be created and the knowledge has to be stored in this particular uh, informatics centers right next is another important aspect is protection of traditional knowledge just now i have given example about the traditional herbs and uh, medical practices that have been uh, that are being followed throughout the centuries from the tribal people so for safeguarding the traditional knowledge innovations and the practices of indigenous communities and the local stakeholders so there is a provision for this particular aspect also right when we observe the objectives of this act so biodiversity conservation so obviously uh, through this act there has been an effort to conserve and protect the biodiversity next is equitable benefit sharing so whenever the traditional knowledge has been accessed the benefits have to be shared with the local people next is sustainable resource use so basically the act mandates that there is no unsustainable use there is no over exploitation of biodiversity whatever you are we are using resources that should be sustainable use next is institutional capacity building so to protect and uh, preserve the biodiversity there should be institutions institutions so whenever they have good capacity i mean su uh, sufficient capacity then only they can protect the biodiversity well so to make this possible the capacity building of this particular institutions has also been incorporated through this act next is community participation so when it comes to preservation of biodiversity including the wildlife and forest 
the uh, community plays a critical role so there is a provision i mean the one of the major objectives of this act is to make the community part and parcel of the conservation efforts next is the national green tribunal act 2010 this act has been enacted to address the growing challenges of environmental degradation and pollution so it establishes the national green tribunal so this is very very important when it comes to this particular act ngt national green tribunal tribunal has been created because uh, there have been many cases cases uh, that are pending when it comes to the environment environment right so the regular courts they are already suffering with lot of cases pending pendency of cases so part and parcel of that is the environment related cases so the uh, the judiciary is not in a position to dispose these cases uh, fastly however another important factor is so the environmental uh, cases or disputes they require special knowledge right so the, the regular courts are devoid of this we can say the regular judges they are devoid of this special knowledge when it comes to environment so to address these issues one is pendency and the second one is special knowledge so the uh, responsibility of judge or we can say uh, ruling on this environment related disputes that has been uh, i mean ngt national uh, national green tribunal has been created and they all uh, i mean most of the environment related disputes have been uh, taken to ngt national green tribunal so it has started giving judgments on the environment related disputes so basically this has act has been brought in to foster or uh, we can sp say speed up the disputes uh, disposal of disputes related to environment so that the environmental governance can be better administered so this is the uh, major objective of this national green tribunal act so under this act national green tribunal has been created consisting of expert members who are ex experts when it comes to environment so with backgrounds of environmental law science and administration to adjudicate environment related disputes right so jurisdiction and powers when we study the uh, environment related bodies there we will study in detail about the national green tribunal right so some of the objectives of this act is so environmental justice to better and better administer and speedily uh, give judgments on environment related disputes enforcement of environment related laws so in regular courts there was a pendency to hasten to speed up the process of environment enforcement of environmental laws also this act has been brought in and uh, prevention and uh, remediation so uh, through this ngt act we can take proactive measures proactive measures to protect and conserve the environment so this is also one of the major objectives next one is expertise and specialization we have just now understood so through this uh, mechanism of ngt experts have been induced into the adjudication process of environmental related disputes next is promotion of sustainable development so when all these goals are realized we can better protect the environment and we can realize the goal of sustainable development next one is another important aspect uh, uh, from this area also there have been lot of uh, they have been there have been questions asked in the previous years so coastal regulation zone notification of 2018 so basically we call it as crz rules All right so when it comes to environment or sustainable development the coastal coastal areas play an important role so we can uh, we can understand that these coastal areas they are uh, many in many uh, areas they are highly or hugely populated hugely populated and they are ecologically very significant because uh, i mean the ocean i mean many species are there in the ocean also so in the backwaters also and are in the coastal areas 
they are also home for mangroves so many uh, wildlife are dependent on these mangroves so it is a very critical area when it comes to event development and also from the ecological point of view so to uh, preserve these areas also the coastal regulation zone uh, rules have been notified so basically this notification crz notification it classifies coastal areas into different zones right based on their ecological sensitivity and vulnerability right so why this is categorization categorization it is to better administer these areas better administer uh for uh, the areas where uh, the ecological significance is much so that uh, those areas can be better administered administered through this categorization right now we will understand the so through this notification there have been the coastal areas have been divided or classified into four categories crz1 crz2 crz3 and crz4 right we will understand what are the four different types of zones right crz1 these are the uh, most sensitive ecologically sensitive areas so when we see the features of these areas so these areas include ecologically sensitive habitats such as mangroves coast coral reefs sand dunes and uh, tidal nesting sites so they are ecologically very very significant or important regulation so development activities are strictly regulated to minimize disturbance to sensitive ecosystems and prevent habitat destruction so these areas are highly regulated right next one is coastal regulation zone 2 these are, are the urban areas urban coastal areas they are they have been put in this category so this zone encompasses developed or urban urbanized areas along the coast including cities towns and industrial zones right development activities are allowed here subjected to certain restrictions and conditions to mitigate adverse impacts of coastal environment and infrastructure so developmental activities are allowed here but there are minor restrictions next one is coastal regulation zone area 3 these are the rural areas those have been put under this category right so these comprise rural and agricultural lands fishing villages and the traditional coastal communities so here limited developmental activity is permitted primarily for the livelihood and the basic needs of coastal communities right so restrictions are there on large scale construction and industrial projects next one is islands so whatever islands are there they have been put under the crz zone 4 right right coastal coastal areas of islands so they have been put under crz4 right developmental activities are regulated to protect fragile island ecosystem cultural heritage and the traditional livelihoods of island communities so these are the features and uh, regulations that are placed in the particular crz areas so try to remember these aspects also uh, in prelims there may be question about the the areas categorization of areas and the associated features which areas have been put under the particular uh, crz category coastal regulation zone category so try to remember these aspects next is the important and last act today we are discussing and also the very very important act when it comes to conservation of uh, the environment also along with the people who are residing there right so it is a landmark legislation aimed at recognizing and securing the rights of uh, forest dwelling communities so till now the ownership rights have been deprived ever since the forest rights act of 1926 so from the british time so through this act all the forest within the territory of india that has been declared as the property of the government and not of the people so since then the we can say ownership rights have been deprived 
deprived for the people who are residing in the forest areas from the i mean centuries time so through this act that right has been taken away so the forest rights act of 2006 it has made an effort to recognize the uh, rights that have be i mean the rights of the forest dwellers uh, the people who are depend dependent on the particular forest the nearby forest and who are leading their life by depending on it further they were playing a critical role in preserving preserving and protecting the area and uh, the associated biodiversity in that particular area right so basically the act has made an effort to uh, secure secure or recognize the rights of forest dwelling communities particularly the scheduled tribes or the adivasis indigenous people who are residing in the forest areas right so the key provisions in this act is recognition of rights so basically the act has tried to recognize the ownership rights of the uh, tribal people who are resid- residing in that areas so forest dwelling communities the rights have to be recognized so the two types of rights are there so one is individual rights next is community rights so one particular a particular area has been given the property of a community not an individual person so those kind of uh, rights are called as community rights so similarly there was a, there is a provision for recognizing individual rights also on the particular forest area right so forest uh, communities to land forest resources and the habitat traditionally used and occupied by them for sustenance and for livelihood right next is rights to forest land so provision for granting individual and the community forest rights uh, for including the right to ownership access and uh, use of forest land for cultivation habitation grazing etc so all these rights will be there is a provision for recognizing all these rights of forest dwelling people next is uh, community forest rights as i have explained so there is a provision for individual rights and also there is a provision for community rights so recognizing the collective rights of forest dwelling communities over community forest resources so empowering them to manage and conserve forest for sustainable livelihood and environmental protection right so process there is a provision detailed provisions uh, there are provisions explaining the details about how to claim these rights how to claim the individual rights or the uh, community rights so protection from eviction so there is a provision also for uh, protection against the eviction of the traditional people who are already dwelling in a particular forest area <laughs> so there is a provision for this particular purpose also when we understand the objectives of this act so the one of the major objective is empowerment of forest communities so over the time they have been deprived of the uh, forest right so this act tries to set right that deprivation and recognize the right of traditionally dwelling people on the forest lands so in this way the act try to empower the indigenous forest communities right promotion of livelihoods so the basically the whatever the, the dependent population they can collect collect minor forest produce minor forest produce forest produce and they can do sustainable agriculture also in the area i mean uh, within the area where their rights have been directed i mean detect uh, sorry identified so in this way the promotion and the preservation of livelihoods can be ensured for the traditionally uh, traditional uh, dwelling people in that particular area next is conservation of biodiversity so as we have discussed already so this local people local or indigenous people right so they play an important or critical role in the protection and the conservation of forest earlier it has been felt that it has been believed that uh, the people they are a problematic aspect whenever it comes to conservation of forest so there was a false belief that 
these people are creating problems in conserving the forest so efforts have been made to evict these people from the forest areas so of late their critical role in conservation and promotion of environment and ecology especially forest has been realized so now uh, i mean the one all the i mean the objectives of all the acts till now we have discussed this so they have recognized the importance of this indigenous people and uh, in conservation of biodiversity and uh, uh, protection of biodiversity their role has been uh, recognized so conservation of bi biodiversity by identify identifying the critical role of the local people so there have been efforts to conserve the uh, biodiversity next one is recognition of indigenous knowledge so whatever the practices that have been employed by this local people so the importance of those aspects ha has also been realized and there have been efforts to preserve and protect this indigenous knowledge also right social justice and equality so when these rights of uh, these people have been recognized and they have been promoted so there is a scope for social justice and equality also so these are some of the major objectives of this particular act forest rights act so when we discuss the main topics we will try to understand the we will do a critical analysis critical analysis of this forest right act so basically uh, the uh, practically the power to recognize the community or individual rights that has been given to the state governments so the state governments are at the helm of deciding or uh, giving these particular rights but the state governments are not that enthusiastic to grant the individual rights so there is some success in granting the community rights right community rights some of the community rights whatever the claims coming from the indigenous people so among them from them some of the community rights have been recognized but there is lot of hesitation in granting the individual rights because of the apprehensions of the bureaucracy so when we discuss the main topics we will go deeper into uh, these aspects and we will see some data also so how much proportion of the individual rights are uh, accepted and how much how much uh, percentage of community rights have been as accepted and what is the if you understand the uh, gravity of the rejection rate almost 94 to 95% claims for individual property or individual rights have been uh, rejected by the uh, respective state government so we will understand the problems of this uh, in uh, i mean we will understand the various aspects associated and the problems in recognizing or uh, bestowing the property rights on the indigenous communities right now we will see some questions that have been asked previously from the these topics uh, first question is it is asked in 2019 question is consider the following statements uh, the environment protection act 1986 empowers the government of india to statement 1 state the requirement of public participation in the process of environmental protection and procedure and manner in which it is sought right statement 1 statement 2 lay down lay down the standards for emission or discharge of environmental pollutants from various sources so which of the following which of the statements given is or above uh, is uh, if, uh, given above or correct so basically you can see here a uh, direct there is a question on the uh, on the provisions of the act directly the question is on the provisions of the act so here both the statements are correct they have been prescribed there are provisions relating to both the aspects so the answer is both one and two correct correct option is c next question is it is asked in 2013 so question is under the scheduled tribes and other forest uh, right, uh, forest dwellers basically this act is forest rights act so simply it is called as fra forest rights act so the proper name of the act is so scheduled tribes and other forest dwellers recognition of forest rights act 2006 
who shall be the authority to initiate the process for determining the nature and extent of individual or community forest rights or both so options are state forest department district collector or deputy commissioner tahsildar block development officer mandal revenue officer so option d is gram sabha so here the correct option is gram sabha so basically the process will be initiated by the by the gram sabha right so gram sabha initiates the process of recognizing the rights whatever it may be the individual rights or the community rights the final authority is state forest department so try to uh, remember this difference right so correct option is option d gram sabha right so these are some of the questions asked so you can see there are directly questions are based asked from the provisions of the act so you also keep track of the all the acts related to environment and also the latest developments and amendments in all these acts right uh, this is all for today thank you thank you for joining the class see you next time until then have a good day bye